Okay, ברוכים הבאים לכל הדורשי תורה. We're carrying on another week of Torah learning, the Simcha. We're in Perek Shlishi, and we are up to the second part of Mishnah Beis. Rabbi Hanania ben Tardion Omer, Shnaim sheyoshvin ve'ein b'neihem divrei Torah, two people who are sitting, and there isn't between them words of Torah, harezen moshav leitzim. This is a dwelling place of scorners, scoffers. Shneemar uve moshav leitzim lo yashav. As the Pesach says, the first parak of Tehillim, that one should not sit, or one did not sit in the dwelling place of these scoffers. Aval shneem sheyoshvin ve'yeish b'neihem divrei Torah, the two people who are sitting, and there are words of Torah between them, shechina b'neihem, and the shechina dwells between them. Shneemar, az nidberu yirei Hashem, then the Yira Hashem will speak, Ish al Rehu, one to his friend, the Yakshev Hashem ve Yishma, and Hashem will listen and he will hear. The Yikatev Sefer Zikaron lefanav le Yirei Hashem ve Lechoshvei Shemo. Ainly el Ashnaim, Minayan Afilu Echad, this is only with two, how do I know it also applies with one? She Yoshev ve Osek ve Torah, that one person who sits down and learns Torah, Shekadosh Baruch Hu Kovea lo Scharo, that Shekadosh Baruch Hu gives him reward. The, the Gemara brings the final pasuk. Shnemar yeshev badad veidom ki natal alav. There are many, many, many questions on this Mishnah. We're just from the beginning all the way through to the end, it, it's—I uh, wouldn't say it's endless—but there are many questions which just make the whole Mishnah, as well as the bo- broader question of what the message is. But even on the details, let's start with it. So first, Rabbi Chanania ben Tardion says, "Shnaim shiyoshvim." Why does he have to say your shvim? Why does it make a difference if they're sitting? And if they'll be standing, and if they'll be walking, why does he emphasize the idea of the sitting? And then it says, Ve'ein b'neihem. What is the word b'neihem coming to add? There isn't between them. Are we talking about between them words of Torah? Divrei Torah. And just please note that it says here, Divrei Torah. And later on, when it speaks about one person, it says, Osek Torah. So why the word Yoshev? Why the word b'neihem? Why the word Divrei Torah as opposed to later on Oskin B'Torah? And then it says, Harezeh Moshav Leitzim. Now that's also very strange. The fact that someone doesn't learn Torah, does that make him a late? Does that make him someone who's ridiculing, who's scoffing, who's scorn, a scorning? I mean, those are very harsh words. That you would say about someone who speaks Lashon Hora, perhaps. Someone who takes an important value and they deride it. But this is talking about two people who are just sitting quietly and, and talking about something neutral. They're just talking about the weather. They're talking about the news. It doesn't say here that they're doing anything wrong. They're just sitting down and they're not saying words of Torah. So where do we get the idea to call them leitzim? That they are leitzim. And not only are they leitzim, but it's a moshav. What does moshav leitzim mean? Just say they are leitzim. If you, if you already want to say leitzim, say they are leitzim. What does it mean there's a moshav leitzim? So we already have six questions over there. What is the yoshvim? What is the benehem? Why does it say divrei Torah and not osek Torah? Why does it say, Bichlal, they're leitzim, they're not leitzim, they're not, they're not ridiculing anything, they're just not learning. And why is it a moshav? Five questions. Uh, uh, and the sixth question is, and what are you proving from the pasuk? Right, the pasuk just says, you shouldn't sit amongst the moshav leitzim. It doesn't mean that people who are not learning Torah are a moshav leitzim. So it hasn't proved its point. I mean, the point that it wanted to prove was two people sitting and not saying whether the Torah are a moshav leitzim. What does it say? You shouldn't sit in a Moshe of Leitzim. Okay, but who says that defines a Moshe of Leitzim to be where two people aren't sitting? So that's the six questions on the first part of the mission. Hope we can hold on to all of those and, and give them a clear answer. Aval shnaim sheyoshvim v'yesh b'neim divrei Torah, shechina b'neim. Shneemar. And again, the posuk that it brings doesn't exactly see how he proves it. Az nitzbaru yirei Hashem el re'ehu. It doesn't say that we're learning Torah, but I guess we're presuming that if they yirei Hashem, they must be speaking Torah. And then it says, V'yakshev Hashem V'yishma, double language there. And then it goes on and says a whole other pasuk that we don't need at all. We've already proved the point. Hashem is there amongst them. But then it goes on and it says, V'yakatev sefer zikaron lefanav li'irei Hashem v'lechoshvei shemo. What is that extra pasuk coming and doing? And then it seems to have finished. But then it says, it's not only true with two, uh, but even with one. But then when it says that one is something else. About one, it says that they're Yoshev Osek Torah, not Divrei Torah. So we have to understand that difference. And it doesn't say that Hashem is amongst them. It just says Hashem gives them Scha. 
שהקודש ברוך הוא קובע לו שכר, ואני אגיד לנו את הפוסט, אנחנו צריכים לראות איך זה עונה, איך זה עונה את הפוסט. אז יש לנו הרבה עבודה אחרת. אז לפני שנכנסים לשאלה הזאת שאני רוצה לראות, שזה מה שהם מראים פה, אני רוצה לראות עוד פעם פירוש, שאני חושב שזה מאוד מרגיש, ואני חושב שזה מאוד מרגיש. אני אגיד לכם את ההיסטוריה מאחורי הפירוש, לפני שאנחנו באמת עושים את זה. היה רבי קרן ביבנה, הרבה זמן לפני שאני באתי. And his name slipped my mind, but his uh, sefer is called Sia Hasadeh, and his first name was Yitzchak, and he lives today in Harnof. He's an elderly Jew. He's also a Mekubal. Anyone who's still in Karen Biyavana now, I quoted him with a tish that I gave recently, but on a different point, not on this point that we're saying now. Actually, I quoted him on something that everyone stopped me and said that Rav Saraf just said that that same night. That's, I quoted him on recently, Apashas Balak. But now on a different idea. So he... He once read a perush, which in all my researching here and all the different svarim that I have, I didn't find this perush anywhere written over here. And he told it over to the Rosh Hashiva Zatzal, to Rav Goldwicht. And Rav Goldwicht loved this drasha so much that he would say it over many, many, many times. And he wrote it, and it's written up in his svarim, in Asefes Marachos. And you can hear the, the power behind the Rosh Hashiva. In this drasha, so I want to share with you, even though it's not connected to the rest of the flow, but I want to say, but it's, you can't let this mission pass while sitting in Kerem Biyavne and not quote this pshat, which is the Kerem Biyavne pshat of this idea. So this is how Rav Goldvich Zatzal used to used to read this mission. He said he focused on the one question that we asked. I think it was number five or six, which was why does it say Moshev Leitzin? Who says there was a Moshev Leitzin? They just weren't learning Torah. So if they weren't learning Torah, that's fine, but why is it a Moshe of Leitzin? That's the question that he wanted to focus on. And many Rishonim asked this question. Rashi, the Rambam, Rabbi Yonah, many asked this particular question. So the interpretation that Rav Goldach quoted, based on this other Rebbe who's still alive, his name I can't remember, Rabbi Yitzchak someone, Siach Sadeh, so the following Pshat. And, and there's a lot of backing to this Pshat, a lot of backing. There's an idea in Chazal, Shinui Makom Shinui Mazal. The Raman brings it in Hilchus Tshuva, that when a person wants to change their mazal, they should change place. What's the idea of it? Is it something psychological? That you, when you're in a certain place and there are certain influences of people on you? Or is there something even more inherent here? Something really core? Something really based? Is it possible that there are certain places which those places are engender more holiness and other places which could engender the opposite? So certainly we believe that the base of Migdash was the holiest place. That was the place where we had an open connection to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Even today, people will go to the Kotel to daven there because they recognize the Kedusha of the Makom as a holier place. People will also go to Kever Rachel and the Kivrei Tzadikim Acherim, Maras Samach Pela, because they recognize that place is a place which has extra Kedusha. Chazal also speak about Shechem being a place which is Mu'ad Lepuranut, And then Chazal go and list all the terrible things that happen one after another, beginning with Dina being attacked and raped and many others, um, which happened all in Shechem, because Shechem was a place which was miyuad al It's a place which the place itself was a physical place in this world, which I don't know how to say this better, but just it has negative energy. There are some places which have holy energy, that you go to the base of Migdash, you go to the Mars of Machpelah, there are certain places which have holiness, and certain which places which don't have. And those places, you have to be aware of it so that you can tap into the holiness and go to those places. And the places that are negative places, you have to be aware of that too, so you can know how to avoid them. There's a beautiful drasha that uh, modern day uh, people bring regarding the Rashi when it says that Yehuda went down to Goshen. It, Rashi says there, why did he go down to Goshen? Latkin lo Beit Talmud in order to establish a yeshiva. And Rav Eliyahu Lapian, he says the following idea. Rav Eliyahu Lapian says, why was he going down to found the yeshiva by himself? Who was he going to teach? He was going to sit there by himself and learn. He was sent ahead of everybody else to found the yeshiva, but there was no one to teach Torah to yet. So Rav Eliyahu Lapian said this following idea, that when you go to a place, then if it's not yet determined if it's a holy place or, not a, or a negative place, then the first acts that you do there will determine the status of that place, and then everything will follow as a result of that. So if a person goes down there, Yehuda was going down to found the yeshiva, and that yeshiva then comes a holy place, and there's a positive influence of everyone who then comes down, it will be uh, rooted in Kedusha. I quoted this, if anyone was there, 
when we had the Chanukah Tabayit, when we moved into this home about a year and a half ago, I quoted this idea, oh, that's the mindset behind doing a Chanukah Tabayit. When a person moves into a new home, it's the beginning, the founding, and when he founds it based on Kedusha and Tahara, that, and, and that in, and enables that everything that will then follow from that place will follow in that path of Kedusha and Tahara. So there is a concept of certain places having a positive influence on you just by you being there. And there's a concept of places having a negative influence on you by you being there. Uh, Rav Zilberstein quotes an amazing thing. In the time of the Romans in Eretz Yisrael, there was once a, a Jew who was captured by a Roman and uh, they said, we're going to kill you. And they gave him one final request. And his final request was to go to the next road. And they moved over to the next road and they let him free. And they let him go free. And someone said to him, how did that work? What just happened there? So he said that on that first road, there had, there had been a murder. And since there had been a murder, then it brings out negativity or anger or hatred in that place. So he just said, move me to the next road. And then that freed him. The Gemara Brochas also speaks about when there's demons, you should jump four amas away from where you're standing because there's a negative energy of that particular place that you're standing. But by moving four amas away, you're outside of the realm of where they could harm you. So there is a concept, quite entrenched concept. There are physical places in the world which have Kedusha emanating from them and you will be influenced by going to that place for Kedusha. Now, when Rav Goldwicht used to quote this, then he would put his hands up. I never saw, I was not Zohar, unfortunately. He passed away five years before I came to Karen Biavne. But apparently he would lift his hands up and he would look at all the pillars and he would say, that there is Kedusha Satoira absorbed in the walls of the base Medrash of Kerem B'Avne. And when a new Talmud walks into the base Medrash, he just has to walk in. And just by sitting in the walls of the base Medrash, all these walls that have absorbed the words of Torah that's been learned in this base Medrash, then it influences him, and then it affects him, that he has the desire to become a Talmud Chacham. He has the desire to follow in the way of Torah, just by being in the base measures physically, he's able to absorb all of that. There's a, I don't know if anyone's noticed, but there's um, very beautifully designed pillars in Kerem B'Yavne, each of them by the different Shvatim. And recently, a friend and also a family member came to Kerem B'Yavne, and he deals in woodwork. And he was very, very impressed by these pillars. And he asked me who made them and where are they from. I had no idea. So we looked together about who the artist was, and we went to that person's website, and it said there, that the, the idea behind was that these would give inspiration to the Talmidim who were learning in the yeshiva, that they would feel inspired. And then through the inspiration that they get from these uh, woodcrafts, they would be able to then learn Torah in more depth and with more enthusiasm. Now, I must be honest with you, although I do it, uh, admire the, the handicraft of those, I must say I've never looked at them and felt more inspired to learn Torah as a result. But that concept is a very true concept. Because just by being in the base medrash, I don't know if we saw those paintings. Oh, there, Ellie. maybe Ellie will show us one of them right now as he's just joined us. Ellie Isaacs, could you show us one of the pillars just next to you with the wood craftings just on the side there? Thank you. We feel inspired already. Thank you very much. It didn't have the same effect because it was through some plastic, but we do the best we can. So... Just by being in the base medrash, the walls absorb. Now, whichever base medrash you go to, or maybe even your very room that you're sitting in right now, having learned Torah there for the last four months, it's created an extra level of Kedusha just by being in that very room. So that is another, a new interpretation, a fantastic interpretation of this mission. Let's read it together. Shnaim Sheyoshvim, two people who sit down, and they're not learning Torah. How could it be? How could, assuming we're talking about people who are Torah learners, people who are able to learn, how could it be they sat down somewhere and they found they weren't talking Torah? They were talking about the weather and about the politics and about the sports. But how chas shalom could it be that two people who are able to talk in Torah learning sit down and they're not learning Torah? So hareze moshav leitzim. Not that now it's considered a moshav leitzim, but rather this reveals that it must be the place that they sat in, people who did late sunnahs, people who were scorning, who were ridiculing, that they came to this place and then it left a negative energy, a negative vibe in that place. And that's what negatively influenced these two Talmud scholars 
that when they come and sit down in this place, they find themselves talking all nonsense instead of talking words of Torah. Therefore, you should not sit in these places. If you find yourself coming to a place and not feeling inspired or connected to learning, there must be something in that place you're sitting which is a negative. Move place, move Dalal Amas away, move to a different place, a different town, a different base medrash. Shuri Makom Shuri Mazam. That's one interpretation that I thought was very beautiful, very insightful, can give you a lot of ideas of if you yourself find yourself uninspired, it may be something physical. And at the same time, you could choose to move, to live in places and always spend time in places which you know emanate with Kedusha. And that was the first interpretation. But now, so that was Rav Goldwicht in the name of uh, a ta- another ta- uh, Rebbe who was a Rebbe under him, who was a, uh, a, a Ram in Karen Biavn. I want to give another interpretation now, which is going to be the one we're going to focus on today, uh, which also gives great insight. The Maharal asked the questions, some of the questions that we asked, how you prove from the Psuki and why the change in language. And he goes on another track, and I'm going to take his words and elaborate on it a little bit. But let's say the following idea. There are basically two hashkafas that a person can adopt in the world. There's a hashkafa whereby not only what you do, you do from a technical perspective, but it doesn't really have meaning behind it or any inherent value. But rather, everything you do, you have a recognition that not only what you're doing is important to do because that's what you need to do, but there's an inherent value behind what you're doing. There's something more meaningful and it has an effect which is much greater than what you're doing. So let's give an example. If you have a young child who did something wrong uh, and he's told to apologize. So what's the mindset of his apologizing? He's saying, well, they told me to apologize. I have to get out of this sticky situation that I'm in. So I'll apologize. So he does the external act of apologizing, but it doesn't have that internal transformation of making him recognize that was wrong. And on the positive side, if a child is told to say thank you for the food that he was given, then he may, at the external level, say thank you, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it will transform his inner world and help him to recognize that having a karaz atob is inherently valuable midah, and it's transforming him. So you could do something from the external level and believe in it and do it, but there's a totally different level of doing it from within. Now, that's all within a person and himself. But there's another level where it's between you and someone else. Because when there's you and when there's someone else, then you have your perspective and your way of viewing things. He has his perspective and his way of viewing things. And there's something third, let's call it a synergy, something which is beyond the two of you, not just about you and him, but it's ideas that come out or an energy that comes out when the two of you are together, which each of you by yourself would not have been able to produce. And even if you would have put your thing down and he would have put his thing down, then it would be two separate ideas. But only when the two of you work something out together and you have an understanding of something together, then there's a new third thing that's built, a kind of a third greater than the sum of the two parts, which is able to come out, which has even more koach, it's even above them. It has more energy even than what each of them independently was able to produce. Now, I'm sure everyone's familiar, if you've ever, ever been in Sheva Brochus, you've probably heard this quoted, but there's a famous drosha in Chazal, I think in Masechet Sota, that says, Ish ve'isha zachu shechina b'neihem, lo zachu eish ochalatam. Right? And there's a bit of a ring of that Mishnah in our Mishnah, which also speaks here about shechina b'neihem. So, here again you see, but this is just a very good example of it, you have an ish and you have an isha, now, each of those by themselves are independent and separate. They can't produce more than who they are. But if they're zachu, if they, well, the drosh is if they're, if they're zach, if they're pure, uh, that's the, the, in, the, in the pshat, meaning it means that they are, uh, they are they're fortunate, zachu, then what will happen? There'll be a third, even greater thing that appears between them, which is the shechina, meaning the point at which they meet, that which is built from their connection, that's so great that it's the Shekhinah. The Shekhinah is coming down to have a higher form than even the two of them. Ish Now what happens if they don't connect? Well, whenever there's 
two things that are supposed to connect, not only is there not that third thing that comes down, there isn't that higher form, that higher level they were supposed to connect to, but rather, even each of them in themselves doesn't really have a standing anymore, and they're burnt up. Because the only reason why they came into existence, these two parts, was in order for them to form their unity and then be able to bring down the Shekhinah. That was the whole goal of them doing, of, of, of existing. Now, when they try and see themselves as independent, and she sees herself as independent, then they're going against the basic fabric of who they are. The basic so now let's try and read our Mishnah and get a deep. So let's we're going to go through and answer all the questions that we asked when we first started, but with this understanding, somewhat based on the Mahara. Now, when it says the word Yoshvim, it's Dafka, because we're talking here not about people who are passing each other, but rather about people who have been Koveya. There's also the Rabbeinu Yonah says this idea. They've been Koveya. They've decided and determined that they need to connect. So they've yoshvin. They're sitting down, they're kavua in something now. They're kavua. The ein b'neihem divrei Torah. What does it mean, ein b'neihem? It doesn't mean they're not learning necessarily. It could be that each of them independently are learning. But there isn't divrei Torah they're sharing between them. What are they essentially saying? They're saying, I have my world and you have your world and there's no connection between us. There's no greater thing that can come around as a result of us connecting. They don't see the value of the unity of bringing out Torah through the connecting the two people's minds together. Rather, each one says, I have my way of viewing it and tough luck to you. I have no interest in the connection. Now, that mindset, in a sense, is pushing HaKadosh Baruch Hu away. Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu comes down when there's two different forces that meet together and when they each understand each other's way of thinking and they're mavater on the negative or the lower sides of themselves and they adopt the higher sides of each other. It's especially expressed in a husband and a wife, but even in a chavrusa. When you have a chavrusa and they learn together and each of them are willing to hear the other side and they're willing to say that you're right. Well, your question enabled me to understand that my pshat's wrong. And that humility that comes through and that refinement that comes through, that's where the Shekhinah has room to come down. What happens if they don't do that? If they don't do that, then he's standing alone and he's standing alone. Then it's a Moshe of Leitzim. Now what essentially Rabbi Hanania is coming to tell us is there is no middle ground. Either you view your Torah as something which is in order to connect Jews, to get a deeper understanding through the unity. It's not just your own I'm doing my own thing in my external way, but you recognize there's depth behind it, which is not just for you, but it's to connect to others and bring out this the greater unity that comes, not just from your individual parts. If you don't have that mindset, then you're ridiculing the essence of what Torah is. The essence of what Torah is, is not given to you for your own private, I want to develop my understanding of things my own way. But rather the goal of Torah is that everyone will share their words of Torah connect to other people and then bring out a deeper understanding that comes from the unity of the minds which Hashem is then comfortable to come and dwell amongst us. So, Shnaim Shioshim, when two people have established they're sitting together, the aim but they said, yeah, but I'm not listening to you and you're listening to me and we're on our own world. That is late sanus. It's not late sanus in the typical sense of I'm actually ridiculing you and making fun of you and saying what you said is, is, is foolish and stupid. But it is late sanus because it's saying, essentially what it's saying is, it's not important to me to take Torah to the place where HaKadosh Baruch Hu will be happy and where Hashem will dwell. Torah is my own thing. Like I gave the example before, I'll do the external act of saying I apologize or the external act of saying thank you, but I'm not looking for the depth behind it, which only comes through the Chavrusa, which only comes through the, the, the discussion that comes through the two people learning together. Now, the way that post continues is, The Torah of Hashem has to be his desire. Meaning the opposite in what Chazal say, what David HaMelech says in the first paragraph of Tehillim, the opposite of a late is someone who desires Torah. The opposite of someone who desires Torah is someone who's doing late sanus. 
And you wouldn't think those are opposites, but they are. Because if you're seeking Torah and wanting Torah, desiring Torah, then essentially you're desiring HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And this the Maharal goes a great length to expre- explain how when you learn Torah and you acquire Torah, you're acquiring a relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And here we can take the same idea a little deeper. There's two elements to Torah. There's the mitzvah of learning Torah, and there's the kedusha that comes through learning Torah. Two separate things. A person could be in a university, and he could be learning Torah in a separate to kedusha mindset. A person can be in yeshiva with the goal of coming close to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And two things happen. Number one is he gains information. And number two is he gains a relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Just like a Mamad Har Sinai. We received the Torah, but we also had a Ma'amad, where HaKadosh Baruch Hu Shechina came down. So to over here, this is what we're being taught. Shnaim Shioshvim V'yesh B'neim Divrei Torah. Where they recognize it's not just about me learning my own way and I'm doing my own thing and I'm disconnecting it. I just want more information. But rather, between them, there is Torah. They're discussing the Torah with a sense of humility to hear each other's views out. And they are in a place where they're able then to connect to HaKadosh Baruch Hu because they're looking for the Kedusha behind the Torah. Not just that I'm proving my way is right, but rather connecting to HaKadosh Baruch Hu through the Torah learning. At that point, the Shekhinah comes down. Now look at the Pasuk that he uses to prove it. As Nidbaru Yireh Hashem, so the Mephoshim here make a dik in the word Nidbaru as opposed to Dibru. Dibru would imply I'm speaking, and then he says I'm speaking, and each one's speaking. Nidbaru is they're encouraging each other to speak, getting each other to speak so they can get a deeper understanding. And you'll note that what's the prerequisite here? Yireh Hashem. If it was just talking about Torah learning, it wouldn't necessarily have to say Yireh Hashem. But since our whole goal is to bring out the Kedusha that comes through the learning of Torah, because our whole goal is the connection with the Kaddish Baruch Hu that comes down in order to enable the Shekhinah to come down, Therefore, you see the prerequisite is Yireh Hashem. And then you understand why it's bringing this positive, because look what the Pasuk says, Ish es el re'ehu. That the only way the Kedusha can come down is number one, you have Yiras Hashem, and number two, you, you engage others in your learning of Torah. Because the Kedush Baruch Hu is one, and His Kedusha only dwells in the world when we act as the one with one another. It's interestingly, in the beginning of Sefer Shoftim, then uh, Yehuda, turns to Shimon, Shevet Yehuda turns to Shevet Shimon and says, let's go out to war. You come with me and I'll come with you. And the, the Mephoshim explain the reason why they did that wasn't just for manpower, but it was because they knew that HaKadosh Baruch Hu dwells where there is Achdus. When people join together, then HaKadosh Baruch Hu comes and dwells there. And therefore Yehuda turned to Shimon and said, let us form a pact of Achdus amongst us. And then we are guaranteed that as Hashem sees his Abduh amongst us, that HaKadosh Baruch will also come down. And then the Shekhinah will be with us as well. And therefore, specifically, it brings the Pasuk of Ish El Re'ehu, because that's the clause in order for the Kedushas of Torah to come down. Not just that I'm learning by myself in my own place, but I'm engaging others in learning with a sense of humility. The Akshev Hashem, and then Hashem will listen. Ah, when is Hashem willing to listen? When each person is engaging the other with humility to not just have the information of Torah, but to have the Kedushas at Torah, so that the relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu will dwell. And that's why it brings the continuation of the Pasuk, and it says, V'ikhtav sefer zikaron lefanav for Yireh Hashem u'lechoshvei shmo. Now, I added another definition here. In the beginning of the Pasuk, it only said Yireh Hashem. In the end of the Pasuk, it says an additional point, Yireh Hashem v'lechoshvei shmo. What happened there? Why did it add another title? Because when you engage another person in learning, and when your purpose of learning is to connect to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, then not only are you Yireh Hashem, but you're then able to relate to HaKadosh Baruch Hu to be Choshev Shmo. You're able to contemplate HaKadosh Baruch Hu's essence. You're able to contemplate HaKadosh Baruch Hu's name. You're able to reach a higher level of Dveikus with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And therefore, it adds the extra possible. Now, if we would pause here, it would be fantastic. And we would have a great understanding of the Mishnah. But then there's many people out there who are saying to themselves, oh my gosh, I'm all alone in quarantine. Here I am in isolation. And this Mishnah, Ishet Re'ehu, two people, B'nehem, learning Torah. There's no hope for me. What's going to be? So the Mishnah wants to come and teach you that although, although it's not the same level of Kedusha when there's two people, when there's only one, but a person should never ridicule the learning that he does by himself. I only know that there's value 
in the Torah learning, and that you have a relationship with Hashem through the Torah learning, when you're learning with two, you and a Chavrus are learning together. Minayin shafilu echad. Now it doesn't say minayin shafilu echad. The shchin and comes down. That's really only with two. But how do we know that with one there's reward? So it says a kadosh baruch hu is a reward. Now that's a very superficial understanding because what was my hava minute here? Did I think in my hava minute that someone who learns Torah by himself won't get rewards? Because that really what it's saying? Two people get reward, one no reward. I mean, it sounds seems funny that Pirkei Avos needs to come and teach you that you have reward for Torah learning. What's the chiddush that it's trying to come to teach you? But let's be medayik in the words. It doesn't say you get reward. It says Hakadosh Baruch Hu Koveyalo Stacha. I mean, this isn't regular reward. But if you're sitting and learning Torah, Yoshev again means that you establish yourself. And here it doesn't say the word divrei Torah because you're not speaking with you and someone else. It says the word osik. Now, osik is a higher level of learning. It's not just speaking, which could be even just a vault, but rather it's you're investing yourself in the learning. Meaning if you just sit by yourself and you just read something without thought, then you will get reward, but not on this level. This is a level of someone who, although he's by himself, he's learning with amelus. He's learning with a depth of understanding. He's osik in Torah. He's being osik in the Torah. What will happen then? He won't get regular rewards. He'll get a Kodesh Baruch will invite him to his own personal castle. Invite him in. HaKadosh Baruch Hu will say, you are someone significant to me. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu will give him a special medallion. He will take a sword and he'll knight him on both sides. But this is not a regular type of a reward. This is HaKadosh Baruch Hu Koveya Lo Sachan. It's a special, unique reward for someone who's learning Torah by himself. But again, it's with this mindset. And that's why it says the word, Ainli El Ashnai, meaning it's connecting the two parts. I mean, what was the lesson that we learned from the first one? That you can bring out Kedushas at Torah in a relationship with Hashem. Ah, on that point of the Kedusha that you can have with the Kedush Baruch on that point it says, ah, you think it's only with two? Really, it is only with two, but there's still an element which is even with one. As long as you're Osek, you're putting in Amelus whilst learning by yourself, even then you can have a relationship with the Kedush Baruch as you see, the Kedush Baruch himself comes and establishes for you reward. So we gave two interpretations. The one, first one from the Siyah Hasadeh, or the idea of that there's actual physical Kedusha in the place, and that you should be careful to choose the place where you are. Make your own home. A bite shell Kedusha, that you use it only for holy things and bring out extra influence of Kedusha over there. The second point that we made was a person shouldn't learn Torah by himself, for himself, with a disconnect from others or a Kedush Baruch Hu, but rather the mindset of Torah learning should always be my goal is not just the information. My goal is to bring out a relationship with the Kaddish Baruch Hu, the Kedusha. And I know the way that I do that. When I form a pact with other people, when I connect to others and I share my Torah with them and I am very open to hear them sharing their Torah with me, then not only will it not be a Moshe of late, so that I'm ridiculing the Kedusha that's here, but it will even be the opportunity to bring down the Shekhinah. And even one person, as long as he's an Amel, by himself will have that unique relationship with the Kaddish Baruch Hu as well. Have a great evening. Have a good night. Hold it.